Now entering the Bitcoin Podcast Network. Yeah. Welcome to the Bitcoin Podcast. We in our chat. Bitcoins, we got them. Acquire, never sell. But catch us rolling deep like a Dell. Bitcoin, blockchains, cryptocurrency. Three guys faded talking Bitcoin, no fee. That's the free Bitcoin podcast, insane. And adoption is still the only thing, thing, thing that matters, man. Hey everybody, welcome to the Bitcoin show. I'm your first host, Marcello. And I'm host number two, D. Episode Yay. number 133. We should see who can sing our intro the best. Like, can you hit that note? Yeah. Yeah. Now you're black. That's I'm not having an R and B contest with you. Why do you not accept that you're black? I don't understand this. <laughs> Just, Your father is black. Right, me. but he's black. You remember that South Park episode where they just gave a bass guitar to Token and he was like, I don't know how to play this. It was like bum, 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 bum. he was like, Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> well you have, anyways. You have hidden skills that you don't know about. That's uh, anyway, that R and B intro is not going away. Anytime oh, soon. I like it, man. I like it too. Very um, good. So we have a like a podcast. Well, first we should mention Corey is traveling, so yeah. there's not going to be too much of a roundtable. And um, we kind of have a podcast guest who's new to podcasting, um, Mrs. Taylor Monahan from My Ether Wallet. Moynihan. Moynihan. Not Moynihan. Monahan. Oh, really? Monahan. Yeah. Okay. I'm wrong there. Yo. Do you only think that you're black when you listen to hip hop music? I mean, are you a little bit mad that I can be selective when I want to be black? You can't be. That's what, that's what I'm telling you. You don't get an option. <laughs> okay. You like I logic. Kinda, you're black and you're white. The moments. You don't get to, you don't get to make that choice. <laughs> Um, uh, so yeah, I, I didn't do too bad in the R&B sing off then. I wish I I want to find that guy and thank him, but I forgot who did it for us. I bet his name is Jacob. <laughs> Anyways, so so what do you think do about quick, my Ether wallet? What do you know about it? This is a quick one, right? Like, are we just gonna get straight into the interview and then release? Yeah, this? we can. I just wanted to know, like, do you know anything about my Ether wallet? I um, know that's where I send. That's where I use Ether. When I buy tokens, it's like the number one Ethereum wallet. It's really good wallet. Holds ERC twenty tokens, which means that most likely, if there's a token, you can hold it with your Ethereum wallet, aka my Ethereum wallet. Um, nice smooth platform. Looks hella good. Um, Corey introduced me to it when we were trying to buy DAO tokens. And we did buy a lot of DAO tokens. And I still have a lot of leftover Ethereum Classic from that. Right on. So, it's actually kind of cool. That's one thing I don't tell people. is like, hey, when Ethereum split from Ethereum Classic, essentially, I uh, I kind of doubled my money for a little bit. It's crazy. Yeah. But since Ethereum Classic lost that economic bout, I actually am just left with a gaggle of Ethereum Classic that I should I should probably use to buy an Xbox X, Xbox One X. Boo! They don't know how to name gaming systems. It's really messed up. It reminds me of like those AOL screen names you used to choose as a kid, like XX, Xbox X, X One, XX. <laughs> I can't even remember what my screen name was. I'm pretty sure I've been Fergalotti since I was like 13 years old. Yeah, it's it's yeah, 
black sauce or for Galati. Yep. The other day, I was actually excited because I have the three I have for Galati, black sauce, or 007.5. And I got this credit card so I can get points. I got, I got, so I stay in a lot of hotels by this one chain. So I got a credit card of that chain. So when I'm staying yeah. in these hotels, I get like quad, I get five points per dollar I spend for staying there. So I basically get nights on nights on nights. It's great. So I was like, well, let me get the credit card. Fuck it. And so I got it. And it was like, what scream name do you want? And I was like, Fergalotti. And it said, Fergalotti's not available. I was like, what? Impossible. Oh but God. it said, what about Fergalotti 007? And I was like, perfect. Perfect. Yeah, but don't you want to hunt down this Fergalotti imposter? It's probably like somebody's trying to beat me. I gotta get him. There can only be one. <laughs> Anyways, right. like uh, we really, whenever Corey's not here, like we refuse to talk about anything crypto related. So let's just get right into the interview. Well, should I tell people about Athena Bitcoin and then we can get into it? Yeah, yeah. All right. So episode one thirty three is brought to you by Athena Bitcoin. It is the most trusted name in Bitcoin ATMs. They're located in Houston, Fort Worth, Dallas. Also, you know, Florida, Chicago, uh, Cincinnati, uh, all over the place. Uh, all you got to do is download the Athena Bitcoin wallet on the App Store or Google Play so you can just figure out specific locations if there's one near you. So for more information, visit AthenaBitcoin.com. They're always adding new locations. And we're also brought to you by Athena Bitcoin's portfolio company, BitQuick.co which is the secure, quick, and easy peer-to-peer Bitcoin marketplace where you can get Bitcoin for cash. In as little as three hours, BitQuick has been serving Bitcoiners since 2013. So where there's a bank, there's BitQuick. It's BitQuick. Get your bits quick. It's the most trusted ATM. Yeah. Dude, I got the best compliment ever. My pops says we made a good show. Like he listened to the recent one. Oh, man. Don't tell me that your pops listen to the show because then I'm like going to be, I got to I gotta watch what I say. Yeah, he said we curse too much. I curse yeah. too much specifically. I'm a yeah. pirate. <laughs> I curse a lot. Well, I can't help about them. money, like feelings get, they run high. Yeah, man. You got a curse. I get emotional, man. You know me. I get real sensitive about my money. That's my best, uh, what's that movie called? Thunder? With uh, Ben Stiller and uh, Matthew McConaughey and Tom Cruise. Oh, Tropic Thunder. Tropic Thunder. I get real sensitive about my foods. Remember that part? <laughs> yeah, I actually just watched that movie on Netflix. <laughs> that movie is amazing. Survive. Anyways, um, let's get into the interview. Qualify right. the folks. Taylor Monahan with my Ether wallet. Here... Wait, you're not gonna like introduce any more than that. You're just gonna Taylor Gucci. Monahan. Here it is. Gucci. Here it is. All right, today we're here with My Ether Wallet, Taylor from My Ether Wallet. Welcome to the show. I'm really excited to talk to you. Been kind of a fan of what y'all have created and and the service y'all offer to the Ethereum space for so long that it's it's nice to finally have you on the show and and talk about the ridiculousness that's going on and the ridiculousness that will probably continue for the near future. Yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to to be here and talk about some of this crazy, crazy life. Yeah, so um, I guess like some of our listeners aren't Ethereum fans. Some of the listeners are Bitcoiners. Why don't you, for those that don't know what my Ether wallet, why don't you give us an introduction as to what it is, why it got started, what problem it's it's solving, that uh, when how it got so big because it's solving that problem. Um. So my Ether wallet is a client-side browser-based wallet for Ethereum and tokens. And so, you know, essentially what that means is that you can access it via the website or you can, like, download the source and run it locally. Um, but there's no, like, server, central server or anything that stores your keys. So 
um, you basically, it's like a interface almost that allows you to generate a wallet and then you can send your ether, you can send your tokens. Um, we have some other cool features that are like really Ethereum based. So we have, um, the ENS tab, that's where you can get your like Taylor.f name and we have like the contract tab. So you can like directly interface with, you know, different smart contracts and stuff. Um, we got started basically because I wasn't comfortable um, with the command line and I really didn't feel like moving like a bunch of ETH around on my, you know, in terminal. So um, my partner, KVH Nuke, he, uh, we used to work together. And so he um, basically made me like a button that I could like generate a new wallet and then, you know, send a transaction. And it was really basic and ugly and um, quite useful. And so we shared it with some friends. And then we posted it on Reddit, and then that was like pretty much the end of everything. Like it just blew up from there. Um, I think like, I mean, I think one of the biggest reasons that we got like so big was just was because of these tokens. Actually, we like very early in the process um, allowed you to send like any token or add any token. So that was like, you know, just. Uh, leagues ahead of like jacks and stuff. Um, but yeah, we're dealing with the scaling issues now. Yeah, you're, you have this kind of unique perspective of because, because you've made it so easy for people to get into these ICOs that are kind of the new rave right now. Um, you are the funnel almost now. You, you're, the, you're, the, you're the lowest, I guess, the path of least resistance for getting into these <laughs> yeah. things. Yeah. And exactly. And I mean, it's, it's awesome, but at the same time, like there's a long way to go. People, there's a lot of like new people entering the space that just don't even understand what a key is. So, um, that's a problem <laughs> and that's something that we're dealing with right now. All right. So like, like let's, let's, let's tap into that. Like what are the problems that you're seeing from your side? Because you have such a unique perspective of, I guess, the issues that the network faces or the issues that the end user faces because they don't quite understand. So, like, what are, what are the main issues that are happening here? I mean, the main thing is that it's just really new. Even people coming from, like, the Bitcoin space, there's still new elements of Ethereum that are really, really different. So, for one, like, the gas and that entire concept is just it's like not a transaction fee it's like gas and ether is supposed to be like the fuel of the network it's like the thing that runs the network and that gas is paid in eth and it kind of acts as a transaction fee but it's not exactly the same because even if your transaction fails you still have to pay for that gas then there's like the confusion with like the gas price and the gas limit which are different um and then you know for new users into the space people who like aren't familiar with bitcoin or haven't had a bitcoin wallet or maybe I've only been on Coinbase, the issues are like, what is a key and what do I save and how do I save it? And, you know, oh, I really have to remember my password. Oops. You know, people are just so, so familiar with not having like to ever actually save anything. <laughs> There's always a backup. There's always a fallback. There's always someone that will like, you know, answer your email and save the day. And the reality is, is that we are really security minded and we don't have anything like we don't save anything we don't like we we don't save anything we don't even have logs like on our servers of ip addresses or anything else we just got the um the cool stats that i've been posting on twitter those we got up like two months ago and it's literally just a count like a tally of the api calls and that's it so you know it's it's just different and um it's going to be a learning experience and you know, we're, we're working on a new interface that, sorry, we're working on a new inter, uh, we're working on a new interface right now that will hopefully like, you know, um, basically force new users through a wizard and, you know, educate them about some of this stuff and the importance of backing up their, their keys and remembering their passwords and stuff. Yeah. I was going to mention like, how's a non-developer supposed to know the difference between like a client side or a server side wallet. Cause all they see is a website telling them that they have a place to store their stuff 
And even after you explain it, most people aren't going to understand. Right, exactly. So, I mean, I've <laughs> I've adjusted the front end, especially the generation flow, like, I mean, constantly since we started. Um, we've gone back and forth from having, like, more warnings to less warnings to trying to really educate the user to, like, just being, like, just save your freaking key. Like, that's it. Um, you can cuss. It's okay. <laughs> the... the um, like if you're a new user, the main the main difference or like the main way that you can tell if you hold your keys or not is like whether or not you have um, something be- besides like a username, login, username, password, login situation. Um, mm-hmm. So like if you're you're going on Coinbase, you're going to enter your username and you're going to enter your password and you're going to log in. It's going to be your traditional form with your forgot password thing. With my Ether wallet, you don't have any of that. Like you. You're just basically dropped onto the site, and every time you want to interact with your wallet, you have to like select your either your like wallet file or um, your like twelve word phrase, the BIP thirty nine or whatever phrase, um, you know, in order to basically complete that single interaction. Man, it's it's there's there's two battles you're fighting here. Uh, well, probably a little more than two, but one is educating the user. The other is um, other people, like because you've become so easy. Like for me, you are the the path of least resistance for getting into these ICOs because it's I can create a wallet. It's specialized for this particular ICO. I can store it away safely, and I know no one has touched it. it like, I have a nice separation of, of funds, uh, so it's it's perfect for what I'm trying to do. And so because you're that path of least resistance, everyone goes through you, which allows people who don't necessarily know what they're doing to invest large amounts of money into something, which lowers the barrier of the types of money that can get into the system. Cause like up until we've created these tools that allow for people like that to get in, like we did, we had longer ICOs because the people who had the money were too ignorant to join literally couldn't put money into it. Yeah. And now no, it's true. <laughs> everyone can put money into it and they don't necessarily know what they're doing. And we, you know, we've both looked at the transaction logs of these ICOs and seen that like people are throwing ridiculous amounts of money to try and cut in line to get it when you can't cut in line to get it. Like for instance, with Bancor, they set up a, a, a gas price limit so that it was almost like a, you can almost call it a raffle of like the, the miners can't preferentially choose the transactions based on transaction fees. So they were just randomly picking or like it was first come first serve type of thing. And because of, regardless of that, and regardless of bank or telling everyone they were doing that, people still threw large transaction fees at them to try and cut in line and just paid a shitload of money to the miners. Yeah, exactly. And, and that sucks. No, like that, it, I mean, it really sucks. Whose fault is that though? Like it's, it's nobody's fault. No, I mean, it's not, it's, it's, you know, it's just like we, for, for example, we, I changed the interface the night before. So you can't, um, put a gas price above 50 unless you like go through the offline tab, which is more complicated and beyond most users skill. So, you know, for that, I, I mean, I do a lot of things to the interface that are really specific for whatever's happening at the time and whatever support tickets are coming in because, like, uh, they come in waves. And I, I try to, you know, I try to learn from past experiences. Like, I've learned from, there was one ICO where, for whatever reason, our gas estimation function, like, didn't work. Like, so basically, everyone was trying to get in, and everyone's, you know, basically, everyone's transaction failed due to out of gas. Like, the gas limit should have been 150, and it was estimating 90. So, I think I have that you know, I try to, I try to learn from yeah. those things. Um, the, I mean, the other thing is like, they keep changing. Like, so we had our own function, then we use parodies function. Now we're using guests function and they all have contracts that they estimate well for, and they all have contracts that they don't estimate for. So now what I've reverted to is like, literally we have a file that before an ICO, I go in and I, I say, if the user enters this address, automatically set the gas price or the gas limit to be this. And if there needs to be like data, 
you know, give them either fill in the data for them or tell them where they need to go to generate that data. I noticed like, that actually when I when I did a few uh, kind of playing around with trying to pre pre create my transactions is like I'd put the the contract address for that particular ICO in, and it would pre fill all the correct information that I saw from the white paper or whatever the announcement thing is for all the time. Yeah. I was like, oh well, wow, that's that's convenient, and I think a lot of the people who are doing these types of things, like putting incorrect information, are are do, like trying to create these transactions themselves, and then trying to game the system because that's that's the majority of what's going on with these ICOs because this ridiculous hype is going on so much is that people are trying to game the system as much as possible because they can flip the coin as fast as possible for a given profit to the actual users that would like it for the utility of the token. Right. Which is, exactly. in and my opinion, the underlying problem of all of these things. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think that like when you when you get to the heart of it, the problem is not necessarily like the gas itself or the contracts themselves or even like the ICOs themselves or like a single investor as an individual themselves. Like it's this, you know, this kind of ecosystem of just hype and and greed and fear of missing out. And, you know, I think another thing that we have to keep in mind is early investors you know, for example, if if you got in on the the Ethereum presale, you bought your ETH at like thirty three cents. So, if you've been around for a bit, you know this price increase is like, you know, you may be not necessarily like a whale in life, and you're sitting here like, oh yeah, I'll throw a hundred ETH, you know, at this at this ICL <laughs> because because you bought you know a thousand dollars worth two years ago. And we see the same sorts of things happen in the larger tech bubble and like, um, you know, the, this sort of like situation that happens where, um, you've got like a 27 year old with billions of dollars who's now investing in other companies and whatever that, I don't know if you guys know this, the stupid blender that just came out or the, not the blender, the, pro, the food processor thing. I have no idea what you're talking about. Okay, so yeah, there's just have. like, there's <laughs> yeah. this thing that, that it's like such a startup thing. And it's just like, it basically, so you know how usually you like juice your own juice? Like you go get an orange and you juice it. It's like that, except it's a machine that only takes its own pouches of like juice. So you basically juice a pouch and the thing's like $600. Baby food processor with pouches is what I'm Googling. That uh, was the first thing that came up. <laughs> I got. I got. I got to hear what you're talking about. Just talk about things until I find this. <laughs> well, you can only you can only use. Okay, those I googled the Silicon Valley juicer. <laughs> Is it the squeeze station? No, nope, that's twenty five dollars. That's not it. Oh, here I got it. I got it. The juicero. Okay, so they got one hundred twenty million dollars in venture capital and it's like who how does this happen the answer is a bunch of people got lucky and got rich early and now they're they're looking for somewhere to place their money and somehow this contraption this contraption seemed to be a good idea oh this thing's you ridiculous. know it, like it's we're in the wrong business Corey. No, I don't know what we're doing. Business. We're in the wrong business. So, I mean, I, there's a term for this. It's called dumb money. And we saw it in the, in the dot-com boom. We saw it in the Bitcoin boom. And a lot of the early investors of Bitcoin who got lucky and made millions of dollars are now funding projects or continue to fund projects in the Bitcoin space that push the ideology of whoever, whatever that person may feel regardless of, you know, how smart they may be. And we're seeing it again, but it's almost exacerbated by the kind of multivariate nature of all the different directions you can go with ICO tokens. I can come up with an idea right now, flap an ICO on it, and probably make millions of dollars. If I just, oh, yeah. if I just, if I just have a pretty website and I, can, and I know the right type of people that are saying, yeah, we'll do that. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people tell us that we should do an ICO. 
And they tell us this for all, you know, they have all sorts of arguments. But the best one that I heard recently was, um, well, you guys are smart and you have like a moral compass and, you know, these idiots are going to throw money at someone for some reason. So you're actually doing like the ecosystem a favor by standing up and letting them throw money at you. And I was just like that kind of, this was maybe a couple months ago. And I was like, yeah, I don't, I mean, I don't think everyone's that stupid. Like, I don't think it's that bad. It is. I mean, and then, and then, yeah, it just, I mean, like every single, every single ICO, it's just another, you know, it's frustrating. It's like another slap in the face of like, you know, not a lot of effort being put into these, not a lot of consideration for risk, you know, and I like, my position in Ethereum is like, I am here for the long term. Like I want to build things, you know, for a year, two years, five years from now. Um, and so it sucks when, you know, you see these, these things just pop up and, and out of nowhere just to raise like millions of dollars. What are your, what are your thoughts on the, on the Ethereum bank robbery that just went down? I think it was like 8 million. Is where they the, just, the free wallet they, thing? Yeah, they drained all the wallets. And I think it's like 8, it's up to 8 million right now, but it's, it's still going up. I mean, yeah. <sighs> well, it's, I hate it. Like I hate, I don't know. Maybe it's cause like I'm a woman or maybe it's just like how I was raised. But like whenever someone steals something, it makes me really sad. It makes me sad when people lose like their private keys too. Like it's, I'm the worst customer support person ever because <laughs> I'm like right there crying with them. Is it, I mean, is it because people are just relying so much on third parties to protect themselves and they shouldn't or you think it's a bigger issue? I mean, in that case, like free wallet, like I don't know who they are. Like I never, I've never spoken with them. I've never talked with them. I've never seen them. Like most of the Ethereum community hangs out on Reddit. And so to never see like the founder of a project on Reddit is a big red flag for me. But at the same time, how can you expect an average user who's looking for a phone app to know that quote unquote Ethereum wallet, you know, on the app store is fake or real? And um, I think that in this case, they were like, like you couldn't come out and just say like, oh, this is a scam that's going to steal your money because they looked like legit and people would put money in them and take money out. And so I think that, you know, most of the like straight up scam wallets are like when they clone our site, it's very easy for people, for me and for everyone, you know, to just spread the warnings everywhere and they're gone the next day. Um, you know, that's what we saw with like Ethereum chamber. They were online for like less than 24 hours. Um, but when you kind of do this middle ground, it's harder. And, you know, I, I think that we just need, like, we need to get a phone app out there, obviously. Well, it's, I don't know. There's, there's, there, there's a, it's a social change that people aren't accustomed to, right? We built this, we built the internet on the client server model, which, which garnered a kind of emergent behavior of delegating your personal responsibility to somebody else. And we, and based on how we built the internet, we, there's a lot of trust involved with delegating personal responsibility to other people. And then blockchain came along and turned that 100, 180% on the, on the, like on its head. You, you no longer can delegate your responsibility to other people, but people who are coming in the space are coming, coming to the space with not understanding that completely. And so it's very, very, very easy to be scammed. And, and Ethereum Chamber is a perfect example of that because most projects are open source just to show the community that understands these things that they are legitimate. But because of that, it's very easy to copy, change a couple, change the front end UI to look legitimate. And if you were honest, you could run a legitimate business based on copying that source code. But, right. or you just change a few lines and steal a bunch of money if you're not honest. And so, and, and to the end user, it looks the exact same. So reputation yeah. is everything in this space. And understanding yeah. is, and not delegating personal responsibility to other people is, is the same. Right. And it's like a cat and mouse game because, so like a year ago, the biggest issue was these phishing sites that would literally just clone our site 
and not change anything and run Google ads on like my ether wallet dot CA or dot or like with mm. only one L or whatever. Um, and those got a lot of people and I spent a lot of time, like basically doing every sort of like takedown request to these different like hosts and Cloudflare and, you know, everyone in between. Um, and then, you know, so we taught people how to check URLs and we taught people how to run it offline and, and on and on, like, don't click ads, like in an ad blocker, don't click ads. You can do this guys. And then these guys pop up and took a completely different approach where they changed the UI, like they changed the color, they gave it new branding. Um, and then they just paid for like whatever press releases and, and to be featured on, on blogs and stuff. And, you know, at, at some level, like I can blame the people that like promoted Ethereum chamber, but at the same time, like, you, I mean, oh. you have to blame them. Like you have one to blame our, the freaking scammers. Yeah, one of our, one of our, our sub shows. Um, promoted Ethereum chamber and it, and once he found out it was a scam, it like, it made him almost want to quit. Cause you felt so bad because he didn't, yeah. know. he just didn't know. Yeah, He took and, it pretty hard and, and it sucks. Like, and it, that's the thing is like, it's like, there's, yeah. I go in circles. Like I want to make Ethereum and crypto more accessible for, for new users. And I want, you know, a diverse user base and a diverse set of people to be able to interact with this stuff. But at the same time, like some days I do wake up and I just wish that like our site was ugly and I didn't have any new people that ever <laughs> wanted to use our site. Tough shit. <laughs> like that's not a reality. You know, it, it, <laughs> um, and you know, and I've thought about, like, I've thought about, you know, is there something that I should do with the front end to make that barrier to entry to like using our site, you know, harder. And, um, I can't really bring myself to do that, but there are, there are days that I get, I get close, <laughs> like just remove all the CSS. Just, just, just purposeful, purposeful difficulties. It's like you have technology barriers just to test your, your, your education in the space to use our product. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, there, there are some like really interesting ideas out there. And like, I mean, status is a great example of something that I think is like worth building, like the things that they're doing and the way that they're integrating with different smart contracts and the way their API works and the way that they are essentially going to be like a light client, not like us. Like we have a, we have a centralized node that broadcasts all the transactions. Um, and they're like, trying not to do that so that's good um there's, there's and like, that those sorts of things i think will help but at the same time like they're going to run into the same issues that we have because their ui is is gorgeous you know mm -hmm. yeah i was i was going to say like that like what i like about status is that the ridiculous scope of the utility of their token it's not a vehicle for speculation it, it will be that's not its purpose though and you can like in order to use the application and all of the splendor that it could be, you would need the token to do all of the different things. And you can do a lot of really cool things that you can't do elsewhere because of the token. That's the point of tokenizing economies. And they're trying to take steps to make so like so when you make these these communities and it, you want to tokenize the community, you need to have a very you want to try for a a good disbursement of your token throughout the community. It's like you want everyone who wants to use the platform to be able to get a token and use it. And that's the idea. But with these ICOs, because the way they're structured and the crazy FOMO that's happening and a lot of investors are making a lot of money, we're seeing very few people have lion shares of the, of the, of the percentages of tokens who act as middlemen when they flip tokens on the open market, the disbursement happens almost on a second layer and the ICO models are trying to change that. I think status is probably doing the best job with Bancor being the kind of the first, the first one to try and change that That's with the capped gas price. And they, they are distributing like pre-release tokens that have a, that will be mapped to 10% of whatever they end up raising. So if they don't raise a lot, then there's not a lot that those people get. If they raise a ton, 
I mean, it's it's still only going to be ten percent of the pool, which mm-hmm. means that regardless of how much they give out, those people like they get to contribute, but it's not keeping the people who want to spend a ton of money out of the ICO. And that they've done, I guess, a few other things to try for that, which are novel. But I'm not terribly sure they're going to win. It's just going to do this same type of thing where people throw a shitload of money at the wall and hope something sticks. Right. I mean, I will say that Status is doing an excellent job of like learning from the past ICOs and, um, you know, trying trying to do better. Um, I think that's what we need in this space. Like, I'll I'll give props to anyone who tries, even if they don't succeed. Yeah, I agree. Um, Gnosis, like, is another example of one that, like, they tried, and you can say what they will about, like, what it ended up being, but, you know, people argued that a Dutch auction would, you know, help curb the FOMO, and, you know, instead you ended up with a situation that's, like, so much worse, and I don't think that (laughs) Gnosis, like, wanted, I don't think Gnosis wanted to be in that situation, like, I think that there's a lot, there's a lot of speculation that, you know, that, that they wanted to end up with a a large share of the tokens, but I really think that they were trying to, that they figured that nobody would ever, the market never, ever like just give them all the tokens. I think, um, the only thing they did wrong or like the main thing they did wrong was set their initial cap too low. It should have been something absurd. So you could have natural price discovery. Because yeah, people don't understand what a reverse Dutch, au- Dutch auction is. Like, it, no one understands that. And people who don't even understand the technology that are still throwing a ton of money at this thing aren't going to take the time to look up reverse Dutch auction. They're just like, here's a shitload of my money. Hopefully, these tokens make me money. So, yeah. The, I mean, this is like, I mean, one of the problems may be that we need to have, um, like, we need to encourage the ICOs themselves to, like, link to discussion like specific threads where people can discuss openly and it's not necessarily like moderated by the team and like whatever goes goes because there was a really great post on reddit like two days before gnosis that was a screenshot of a spreadsheet where it like literally highlighted the top part and was red and it says if we do this this is bad and it had a sad face and it says don't do this like don't if we do this like your tokens basically go to one dollar um they're going to hold like 95% of the tokens, you know, you have to wait here. And if this happens, then we're in a yellow situation with a little straight faced emoji and then all the way to green. We're like, this is where we should end up, you know? Um, and I think that no matter what your, you like your, your level of understanding was like, that's like a sad, angry face. And that's a happy face. You should be able to understand that. <laughs> We're only speaking through emojis from here on out. All right. All my, so I've been doing analysis blogs or analysis articles and they're only <laughs> going to have emojis from here on out. It's just no, no, no more words. No more words. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, you know, one thing that you did, you kind of like breezed through earlier that I, I wanted to, to touch back on was this, um, this idea that like, uh, I lost it. Hold on. I don't know. It'll come back to me. I don't remember. There's like, there's too much stuff in my head these days. I was wondering like, what's stopping another like well-established app to just adopt blockchain technology and offer access to Ethereum services I mean, they're already going to have a massive user base. Uh, so I, I don't know what's proprietary about the status ICO from what's someone else that just coming. What's doing, basically? The Kick app? Yeah. So what if Kick adopts the technology? Boom. Right? Oh, communities. It's all about communities. It's, I mean, like you have to build a community that one understands the technology and what it's trying to do and then enable those people to have like a token that they can feed back into the system. And if you have a very large community that's using your app for a given thing and then you and you add difficulty to it, they're not going to learn a new difficulty. They're just going to move on to something that's just as easy as what they were doing. You have to have some type of incentivization or thing that they couldn't do beforehand that they'd like to do. Now maybe you can find some type of application that is doing 
normal traditional infrastructure. The hell's going on here? Sorry. Normal. <laughs> what are you watching? Uh, my, my my YouTube just moved on to something else. I was watching what? that stupid juicer movie you, you, you showed us. I knew it. <laughs> Uh, oh my God, sorry. Was like, yeah, so like, people are gonna people are gonna go where the stake ownership is, though. I mean, just look how resilient Steam is, all because of that little token they give. Is it resilient? Well, yeah. Though? I mean, look at look at Reddit, and that doesn't even have any monetary value, and people That's love just, their karma. Yeah, the, car, <laughs> the, the karma whore is a thing. It's been a thing. Yeah, it's like the thing. It was even worse, like a few years ago. Like I've been on Reddit for way too long, but. Being like a karma whore, being like the the on the leaderboard was like a goal that people really, really, really tried to get to. You don't, I mean, when we talk about incentivization, like you don't have to put money on it. You just have to like give something and then compare people to someone something else. Well, and people's that, time, that's people's it. time is the ultimate <laughs> scarcity. Like their attention and their time. If you can build an application that will that will bring. That will that will make people come to your application. They spend their most valuable scarcity, which is time, with you. Then you've won. That's 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 all there is to it with modern day technology. And how you but incentivize you... them to do that is the like the moral question. Right. And the problem, and this is like a problem that goes back before even like Reddit, like this has been on Usenet and and Dig and all of them is when you incentivize people to spend their time or their energy or whatever on your site over someone else's uh, and you reward them for that, then you have people who just try to game it in order to collect the rewards without spending the time. And that's what like, I mean, Reddit has this problem. Because Reddit got big enough where, like, you know, you you could the rewards could reach outside the Karma account. It could get you whatever a hundred thousand clicks on your blog, which mm. has ad money, you know. But Steam just is like they just threw the entire problem out the door and was like, "We'll give you money for your time. Let's see how that works out." And honestly, like, I'm surprised that it um, that they've been able to like n- mitigate the just shit post spam as much as they have like i'm surprised if you don't go on there and it's just an you know utterly terrible well the amount of money that you make on steam is directly proportional to how much the people who own the majority of steam like your content if you shit post people who have the power to make you money will never upvote your your shit post it's right. not so it's it's not, there's more... not like a micro community of people it's there, it's, it's 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 kind of centralized in in that if you want to make money, you need to cater to the whims of a very small amount of people. Well, what's the point of that? Well, there isn't one, but that's 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 that's, that's in my <laughs> opinion why Steam didn't why Steam failed. That makes sense. Well, I mean, yeah, but that's yeah. the same reason that they aren't covered in shit posts is because they're centralized. They're but they're essentially like trying to act like they're a decentralized crypto system thing while, you know, having like the heaviest handed moderation there is, which is like, you know, giving power to, to people to decide what goes up and what goes down. Yeah. That's really interesting. I don't think they have, I'm not sure if they intended that, but that was the the consequence of it based on how the, the model works. And that's because, people are going to game the system for themselves. And if you if right. your if your system's rules have the ability to be gamed, they will be. And that's how that's like coming full circle, that's how these ICOs need to structure themselves. The number one rule and how you structure your ICO is if there's a way to game your system based on the way people can invest into it, that's what's going to happen. So mm-hmm. it's not it's it's kind of like this whole decentralized decentralization movement is instead of um, don't be evil can't be evil it's it's in this situation it's don't be greedy can't be greedy and yeah. and if you don't think of that way from square one then you're gonna get taken advantage of because people don't give a shit about what you're doing if they can make money off of you yeah that's. That's the unfortunate reality. Um, and that's so one of the like more popular things that I've heard 
um, from like random people on Twitter or whatever is, well, why don't they just limit how much a single person can invest? And um, I think this is what the dynamic ceiling concept, why status has that in their ICO. But, you know, essentially the problem is you have these whales that take over so that they can play it on the secondary market. So then the solution seems to be, okay, we'll say, you know, that nobody can invest more than 10 ETH. Um, and so then the whales just go and create, you know, 100 addresses <laughs> and send 100 transactions. Mm -hmm. And so then the new problem is um, you haven't solved the first problem and um, you're now limiting the sort of the availability to more technical people. You know, those people that can generate, you know, a multitude of addresses and then programmatically send them at a specific time or, you know, whatever. So that's something that people have to be careful is like when you, whenever you like put a roadblock up, um, you're essentially incentivizing people to like figure out a clever way around it. And if that's the case, what, what are those, you know, what's going to be the result? What's the unintended consequence? And is that a better situation or a worse situation than the original problem? I mean, that's basically what happened with Bancor is that they basically, I mean, yeah, I guess there may have been, um, a anti bancor DDoS, but in essence, because they set the gas price, they DDoS themselves because people just created multiple addresses and sent multiple transactions at the same time, which clocked the network. And I don't want to give anyone any ideas, but like Vitalik called this like two days before. Um, and one of the more interesting things was, okay, well, what if you like also curb this or whatever? And then um, a couple of people in this chat were just like <laughs> coming up with ridiculous automated smart contracts that would essentially like, you know, based on the set of rules and the current status of the ICO and the current status of your various addresses, you know, decide what to invest. And that, like, I, was, I wasn't part of this conversation. I was just observing. That was like one of those moments for me that's like, we're trying so hard to allow everyone to get in and, you know, prevent this greed and this FOMO from taking off. You know, at the end of the day, we're going to reach a point where, like, it's just all contracts or robots. And the secondary market is, like, probably just going to be the place that normal people get it. And then, you know, the only way to sort of, I guess, have that be, like, doable without screwing everyone is like figure out how to price these tokens where you know like a regular like when when a regular company like Facebook when they have their IPO like there's a team of smart people that decide what that that thing is worth at the time how do we do that with like tokens like how do we make it so that the price that you buy at is you know is not going to go up 10x because that's the price Good question. <laughs> Maybe things like Bancor will help that. I mean, I know that's kind of the, uh, the idea of what they're trying to solve is allowing you to almost create micro communities that also have liquidity. If they're able to do that, it'll help alleviate some of these issues that we're having. Uh, but that's a big if. We don't know. And so it's, like, it's, it's one of those kind of chicken of the egg things. We want advanced solutions to a problem that just now got on the scene. Yeah. Um, back to, I, I remembered what, what you kind of mentioned earlier, but um, this idea of like what these tokens are and what value they have, you like, they're very different. So for example, with um, like the DGX token, it's tied to, whatever, like a percent or a something of gold, right? Yeah. Like a gram of gold or something. Um, 30 with, milligrams uh, of gold. I don't know. Yeah. Like and then the DGD is like their Dow one that basically like profits if you, um, based on the transaction fees for like moving in and out of like gold. Um, and then similar for Maker. They have like the same mm -hmm. sort of structure where one's the stable one and then one's like the governance structure. Yeah, exactly. And so, so... Maker, Maker is the governance token that requires <laughs> actually use 
otherwise it goes something goes wrong with it or um bad way of putting it or the or, or die which is the stable coin that's based on what, like that imf or whatever the international monetary mm-hmm. fund is Right, exactly. And then if you go and look at like Augur, like their token has a use, like that's the token that you place your, you know, quote unquote bet with when you're, when you're interacting with the prediction markets. So those are three examples where, you know, those tokens have like a real use case and a real value beyond being just a token to raise money or just a token to hold or just a token that's whatever, maybe going to do something in the future. The, I think the hacker gold ICO, which was a few months back, was one of the ones that kind of worried me the most because I didn't see where the value of the token came from at all. Like the token was basically it counted as a vote and you vote for like projects or teams that um, you liked them or whatever. I don't know what you voted on. Hopefully that they were good <laughs> projects, but you know, you never know what people vote for. Um, but there was like a monetary value <laughs> of these tokens. Like it was an ICO that basically acted as like a crowdfund um, for them to build this new platform. So in that case, you know, ask yourself, what's the value of this token? The value of the token wasn't going to be distributed to the, to the projects that got the most votes they were like separate, like basically whoever got the most votes got $10,000 or something. Um, So the token was just a speculative thing, like literally, like it was something to raise funds with and then it's on the market and so people are trading it, but there's no way to like say like, oh, okay, if this is like, if more people move their gold via Digix, then the DGD token gets more valuable because the profits are going to be bigger. That's easy. Like you can look at that and be like, okay, there's the value. With some of these tokens though, it's like, what is there any external value? Is there any external use for these things besides trading them on the market? Like just pure speculation. And that's something that I think is a big problem as well. I think that's also part of the, kind of nascency of the space and our discovery of what how can we use tokens because right now like you think of a token from a traditional perspective it is a speculative vehicle it's like it's, it's something you use for something else and it has a certain value associated with it and so you mostly think about the value and not the purpose of the token and mm-hmm. it's not until these applications actually come online that get real user bases because there's not really anything online being used in a production environment or throughout the community where people are just using the token for its for its utility they're mainly gathering tokens based on the speculation of that they will use them later on or that people will use them later on and it's because we're in this kind of early place that like that's all there is to it we're all we're all like yeah tokens are cool we hope mm-hmm. we want to collect them all yeah it's like pokemon <laughs> no yeah you're absolutely right though um and the thing is i'm not against tokens being no. a a vehicle for crowdfunding like for raising funds like kickstarter style like where you have an idea and you want people to you know help fund your idea um the ethereum foundation gives you a token if you donate to them so you get this cool little unicorn token and then there's also this it's called the unicorn, the meat grinder, which is basically like the thing that destroys your tokens. Uh, these tokens have no value. Like they're just a fun reward that you get and it kind of incentivizes you to donate to the foundation. That I don't have a problem with. You know, what I have a problem with is, um, you know, if the foundation like created this thing and then this whole, this whole um, whatever surrounding it, uh, and then put them on like the free market to be bought and sold and speculated on. Like that's where things start getting dangerous, in my opinion. Yeah, or or the guise of creating an ICO to build something that doesn't say my token is for crowdfunding. It's for something that I don't I don't know some some garbage. But the point mm-hmm. of the ICO is to raise money, and mm-hmm. the point of the token is to raise money. But that's not front and center on on why they're doing it. That's that's right. a problem, in my opinion. And people, people who are like, 
we, why don't we just do a token? We can make a shitload of money. That's yeah. something you never want to fund. Mm-hmm. <laughs> exactly. I mean, that's the thing. When people say, my ether wallet should do an ICO, my answer used to be, well, what would, what would the token be? What would the value of the token be? Like, we're not, none of these give like a percentage of the company. Um, the Ethereum, the way that Ethereum works makes it not impossible, but, you know, harder to um, like charge like your traditional transaction fee because we already have a clogged network. If we charge to a fee, it would be twice as clogged. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and that's something that most people then respond with, oh, you'll figure it out. Like, you don't have to figure it out now even. Like, you can do an ICO and then figure it out. Yeah. And I'm we'll just sitting money. We'll figure like, it out with our bunch of money. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I'm like, wait, so you're telling me that I should basically um, raise a bunch of money, give people a bunch of tokens, and then, like, hope that at some point we figure out what the value in these tokens are and their use case beyond speculation. But even if we don't, it's okay because... If we just keep building stuff, the value will go up because people speculate, even if there's like literally no proof that these tokens are going to be, you know, increase in value at all. And that's absurd. Like that's just, it's just like, it boggles my mind. It, it's, it's I, I, my personal opinion in all of this is that something's going to have to go wrong. Something is going to go terribly wrong. And that's the only catalyst that's going to keep people from doing this crazy shit. But, and this is what, that's what I used to say. I'm like, the only thing that'll shift the market's mentality is if somebody just like scams out. What I've realized like recently is that it's actually easier to not scam, like not blatantly like run away with everyone's money. If you 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 just. You a ton of money if you have a decent idea. (laughs) But you don't like, I mean, so. Let's say like I'm just greedy and I want to raise $100 million. I raise $100 million. Now I have two choices. I can like just like transfer it all, do like a private sale, cash out on that $100 million, go buy an island, go live happily ever after, right? But, you know, I'm going to have a lot of angry Redditors. I'm going to have my reputation <laughs> might be ruined somewhat, um, you know, and so forth. The other option is that I slowly, like, I'm not, what am I going to do with $100 million besides, like, pay taxes on it? So the better option is to just uh, slowly cash out over time, uh, hire someone to make some medium posts every month or so about the progress that we're making. Um, And then I escape with $100 million and my reputation. And, like, probably a whole bunch of community members who are, like, really in love with these medium posts. And potentially a shitload more money because the price of the underlying asset raised. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You know, these the, the, the the early people who've raised Ethereum on their token sales now have a significant more dollar cost oh, yeah. valuation because Ethereum's raised so much. Oh, yeah. It's insane. And so then, you know, the question is, okay, at what point do you call something a scam? Like, at what point do the posts start coming out? And I'm sure that people who've been on, in, like, the larger Bitcoin crypto space longer than me can answer this because I'm pretty sure there's been like a lot of ICOs that are like different coins that do something similar. Um, but like, I'm pretty sure that they never really die. Right. Like they just sort of like circle the drain and get pumped every once in a while. Is that sort of what these tokens are going to end up doing? I don't know. I hope not. Like I don't, I don't invest in much personally. Like my, most of my plays are, are, pure infrastructure plays based on how I think something can build out that serves a purpose to that's aligned with the un, uh, like overall vision of what decentralized technology can do. And there's not a lot of those. And luckily I kind of, because we have access to so many people through talking to everyone, I get an idea of what underlying motivations people are after when you interview, when you interview them. But most people don't have that, right? Like most people are just like, "There's a pretty website. People are talking about it. I'll throw some money at it." And that's that's not the environment or community you want to build. But because people are making so much money, that's the way things are going to go. Right. I don't so, know. That's... Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. The one kind of crazy thought that I've had recently is 
if you're only an ICO and you're a legit company and you, you know, are trying to build your product, trying to build the future, trying to build this token with utility that's going to have, you know, help whatever turn Ethereum into like this magical thing. Um, why don't you lock like the transferability of that token for longer? Like it used to be that the tokens were locked for 30 days because the ICO went on for 30 days. Now you can transfer them to an exchange the next day. What's the, like, what are potential downsides to locking them for 30 days or 60 days or 90 days or a year? That's not a bad idea. I haven't thought of that. That's that, that could be potentially a really good idea. So that if you really wanted to invest in the company, we say like our MVP isn't going to be ready for this milestone. At that milestone, we'll release our tokens. Uh, but then that that I don't know. There's 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 a there's a balance there because people could just say thanks for the money and leave. If mm-hmm. they never meet that milestone or they come across some problem and the milestone gets pushed because like th- there has to be some type of really good due diligence. And people who really believe in the project would only invest in that type of thing, which may be exactly what we're looking for. Right. Well, I mean, and that's this is you know I have to keep an open mind that there are people in this space that don't think like me but me personally if I throw money at something like I don't like it's I'm holding it I'm not selling it like you know even the ETH that I've I've I, I've gotten the pre-sale like I haven't really sold any of it um I've sold some of it to be sane um <laughs> you know because like when I invested in it I was like list. Well, I live on that too. Um, but you know, I said like when when ETH hits ten dollars, I'm gonna sell a little bit, and when it hits this, I'm gonna sell a little bit. Um, these were all things that I like, you know, outlined beforehand. Um, but now, like we're at whatever four hundred, some crazy ass shit. So I didn't I didn't plan that far in advance. I didn't think we'd hit four hundred <laughs> well, in two I was, years. I was watching an interview you did um, just a few months ago. You're saying maybe the, by, by the end of the year we might hit a hundred dollars. Oh yeah, on crypto's podcast. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I that, don't don't ever take investment advice from me. Like, well, it, when I no one in Ethereum, like I was like, I was like, you know what? This is cool. If I can contribute to this potentially being built and potentially working out in you know in delivering on the promises that it it was promising, I'm happy. Like I was I was fully like a hundred percent like not expecting to see any return like ever um so this is kind of crazy but um you know the that's that's just my approach to investing like i don't i don't invest in much and when i do um i really do try to make it things that i believe in and that way if they go down like i don't freak out because i'm like well at least at least they played a role in like getting this thing built or like at least they tried. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, when I'm looking at things that I could potentially invest in, I look really hard at the team and the dedication of the team and you know, what they've done in the past and what they'll do in the future and how, um, like how the things they're building play into a bigger, you know, picture. Um, but I, I do realize that that's not normal. Like I'm probably like, I don't know, a little unicorn with that crazy, that crazy <laughs> investment strategy. Uh, in terms of the majority of investors, I'd say you're in a small, in a small group. <laughs> yeah. But well, in my I'm opinion, married, that's, that's I'm the, I, married to, to, to a guy who loves trading, you know, like we, like, I just, I yell at him during the ICO time. <laughs> <'cause> <laughs> don't. I'm like, uh, why? I'm like, you're part of the problem. Babe. I bet that makes ah. for fun conversations. All right. Well, I think that's uh, that's 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 quite the, the perfect way to wrap this up. Um, <laughs> why don't you give us an answer to the question we ask all of our listeners? Can you explain blockchain in 10 words or less? What? Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. The blockchain is a chain of blocks that lets you do stuff. That's definitely under 10. Good job. (laughs) (laughs) I'll have to go back and watch them and see what other people say. What's the best one you've heard? Oh, I don't know. Um, 
God, we interviewed, I think, Lil B, this terrible rapper. I, would, I wouldn't even call him a rapper. Uh, and fuck, what did he say? I don't know. It was garbage. <laughs> Bitcoin is money, man. I think that's what he said. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, but uh, we've had some good answers. So you have some people that just refuse to even try and do 10 words. And we'll go on a diatribe. Oh, yeah. Well, but. yeah, I did a podcast the other day that was um, like a non-crypto crowd. And that was pretty much the biggest hot mess ever. Um, they wanted to release it on Monday. And I think on Sunday we spoke. And they're like, yeah, we're going to take like three months to edit this because it's like not cohesive at all <laughs> <laughs> because he asked questions like, okay, hold on. Can you explain what decentralization means? And I'm like, Oh God, like, no, let's start. How many words do I have? <laughs> like where? <laughs> I don't know where to go from here. Yeah. Exactly. So there's this thing called the computer. Yeah. <laughs> so we fluctuated from like really deep dives into, you know, the, you know, the role that crypto could play in like the larger governance systems and in, in emerging countries and those sorts of things to like, um, like, how, like what, what is decentralization or like, what is a private key or, you know, what is Coinbase? Well, these are key concepts that people don't understand that they need to, that, that the general, like the general public doesn't have a grasp at. So I just finished a, a Bitcoin course, educational course that I offer through my company um today and it's just fundamental core competency so that people can leave the course and then maybe start to have a decent conversation or at least vet what other people say when they talk about crypto and like the education is a serious issue and if people Mm -hmm. who are jumping into the space don't have it don't have that core competency they're going to either get scammed or lose their money or have problems or cause problems that they don't know they're causing problems with. And, and, and it's just going to be one of these kind of social cultures that slowly shifts once, like maybe when we have applications that can keep people from doing this. In the early days of the internet, people got scammed all the time with like Nigerian princes trying to send people money, right? It's, mm-hmm. it's the same thing. Yeah, no, it's, it is. And um, you'll have to send me the link to that because that sounds, I really want to check it out. We're actually, so for the next version of my Ether wallet, oh my God, I hate that I'm saying this, but we're doing an email newsletter. So people that are like new and stuff can sign up for it when they create an account. And then it's going to do like an auto, uh, like a 10 week thing where you get an email a week um, that basically like covers, you know, the basics in chunk by chunk. Because one thing I notice is like, I get these emails that are like, They'll, they'll ask one question, but the fact that they're asking that question is like, <laughs> means that they don't have like any underlying fundamental knowledge. And so it's like, in order to answer that question, I'm going to need, you know, I'm going to need to write an essay. You're going to need to so, read this blog, this <laughs> blog, this blog. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I'm like, oh, and then don't forget, you don't get scammed, but also, you know, make sure that you do this and this and you know, at the end of the day, usually I'm like, just stay on Coinbase for a couple of weeks and like check back, like ease into it because I can't like in good faith tell people that don't know anything to use our site yet. And yeah, it sucks. That's, but that's it, reasonable. Uh, so like, I guess, I guess leaving us, like what, what word of advice would you give our listeners and people tr- like, we'll, we'll just go with because people trying to get into the space who are trying to learn how to think about this stuff. Right. So my advice to someone that's like brand new, doesn't understand this is start slow, start on a reputable exchange, like Coinbase. Um, Gemini is another good one. Kraken is better than most, you know, um, and slowly learn about things slowly, you know, expand your knowledge, read Reddit, read the blogs, sit down and like follow that rabbit hole um, and then start slow. Start by transferring $10, not, you know, $10,000, <laughs> you know, start by transferring 10%, not a hundred percent out to your, you know, a my ether wallet or wherever and start seeing how these things work and really get familiar because the worst 
thing you can do is um, just transfer all your money and then like never, never move it again because you have no idea what you're doing or lose your key or whatever. So, you know, the way that I got comfortable with it was like literally sending like 0.0001 ETH around a hundred times. And now I can do it in my sleep and, you know, that number's bigger and it's still fine. Solid advice. All right. I'm going to have everyone pay, take, pay heed to that, that advice as well as tacking on, listen to the Bitcoin podcast. <laughs> okay. Jelly, you got anything Are else? We her with, yeah, we're going to hit her with the 10 words. I already hit her with the 10 oh, words. Oh, you missed it. You missed it. <laughs> oh, you can't let it? people know that. Yeah, you, you had baby problems. Got to handle the baby problems. Uh, well, did she pass? Did you pass? Oh, absolutely. Taylor? Go ahead and give. Go ahead and tell Cello your ten words. That was a great one. Actually. Um, it was the blockchain is a chain of blocks that lets you do stuff. Sounds like my answer. Love it. <laughs> what was your answer? Probably that. <laughs> uh, that probably that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> of course. All right, Taylor. Thanks for coming on the show. Awesome. Thank you guys so much for having me, and uh, keep in touch. Okay.